Good morning and thank you for joining us again today for another uh, Jagged Globe presentation. This week we uh, welcome back British mountain guide Andy Owen um, who is going to talk to us about alpine mountaineering and everything that's involved in that. Uh, this is one of a series of interviews and discussions about mountaineering, trekking and skiing with Jagged Globe leaders and guides that we've been enjoying for the past couple of months. All of these presentations are recorded so please visit the Jagged Globe YouTube channel to watch other presentations that you might have missed over the last eight weeks. Now our speaker today it should be Andy Owen, British Mountain Guide, but Andy is having a bit of an issue logging into Microsoft Teams this morning. Um, so he's just sent me a message just saying he's struggling to get in. So um, Andy's hopefully, if he does manage to get logged in, going to talk to us a um, bit more about the Alpine environment and how that differs from what you might have closer to the home. Obviously, if you're based in the UK, that might be rock climbing, hill walking, or perhaps getting up to Scotland or uh, Snowdonia in winter conditions. So Andy's going to talk about the techniques we use to travel and climb in the Alps and what the individual skills are that we would develop. Um, he's going to go into that in a bit more detail. And we'll also talk about the gear you need once again today, the, the format of the presentation will be um, uh, the, the initial discussion and uh, sorry, initial presentation, and then we'll have some Q&A. Uh, and then I will interject in various places with questions, but feel free to use the Q&A function. Now, Andy hasn't appeared, <laughs> so I think what I'm going to do is um, and I apologise for this. I'm going to switch over to a different presentation just to um, to keep keep us going for a few minutes, and then hopefully Andy will come in. Um, so if you just bear with me, I will just um, get rid of this one. And let's see if we can bring in a different one. So my apologies for this. It's the first time it's happened in uh, in nine weeks. I actually expected it to happen previously, but it didn't. OK. So you're going to have to put up with me for a little bit longer. So we'll just we'll go on with this one, which may hopefully be of interest to some of you. So I'm sorry, we're supposed to be talking about summer alpine mountaineering, um, but I do have a backup presentation here, which is about Aconcagua in a, in South America, which is an expedition. So if you uh, if you stick with us, then hopefully Andy will pop up. If not. Then we'll uh, we'll just continue talking about talking about Aconcagua. So um, so yeah, I'll start off with this, and as I say, feel free to um, to ask any Q and A as we go along. So this uh, this presentation is basically I've called it all you need to know about Aconcagua. Uh, Aconcagua is the the highest mountain outside of the Himalayas. It's uh, located in Argentina on the border with Chile, um, just under 7,000 meters above sea level. Um, yeah, the highest mountain in the western and southern hemispheres, and therefore it's referred to as one of the seven summits, which is the highest mountain on every continent. We tend to go there between sort of late November and February. The season probably extends a bit further than that. Um, so that's their summer, obviously, down there. 
Um, it's a non-technical uh, mountain, but we're very careful not to describe it as a trek. It's sometimes called the highest trekking peak in the world, but as any of you who have been to Aconcagua will know, um, it's certainly much more than a trek. Um, that's due to really the altitude of the mountain and the fact that you've got multiple camps above base camp. You're carrying all your own personal gear, um, so it's physically much more demanding. So a combination of the whole physical and the mental side of it and just um, living on a big mountain like that. And hopefully if this works, you'll get a bit of an idea. So yes, yeah, so that was actually a bit of video shot at Cholera Camp, which is the high camp on Aconcagua. Um, actually doesn't look that bad <laughs> in that video, but it can be very, very windy. Um, and that is a feature of the mountain, as well as often very hot, low down when you're, when you're trekking in at the start, um, but also temperatures can be um, very, very low high up. So we've got to be prepared for that whole range of um, temperatures in terms of the the uh, clothing and equipment we take. So for Aconcagua, we, we do recommend that people have got ice axe and crampon experience, even though you might be able to climb the mountain without even putting a pair of crampons on if, uh, if conditions are quite dry. Um, and that's really more to do with the fact that well, you might have to use crampons and certainly learning how to use them at 6000 meters isn't such a great idea. Um, but also if you've done if you've got the right kind of experience for the trip, you will have used crampons before and, and that, you know, whether that's in in the UK um, or in on another mountain in the greater ranges. Um, wilderness camping, you know, there's a lot of obviously putting, taking down tents. Oh, ah, we've got Andy. Here he is. So what, what I'm going to do is thank you everybody for, for sticking with me. Um, but I'm, if you just bear with me a few seconds, I will sort this out and we can go over to, to Andy. So let me um, just let him come, ac come across and say hello. Hi Andy, how are you doing? Morning Tom. Morning, you're with us then. <laughs> you made it. Yes, we got there eventually. That's yeah. all right. I was just telling people about uh, Aconcagua, so slightly, slightly different from uh, climbing in the Alps, but but hopefully we kept people amused for a few minutes. Big, big uh, snowy mountain. Yeah, exactly. So uh, so yeah, what I'll do is I'll just rack up Andy's slides and then pull those straight across because obviously we've used up a few minutes. So yeah, let's go straight over to Andy then and he can um, he can talk to us about summer alpine mountaineering. If you do want to hear about Aconcagua at some point, let us know in the Q&A and we'll perhaps do that, continue with that one um, in, a, in a week or so. OK, right, Andy, over to you then. Good morning. So uh, the Alps on our doorstep, um, the most accessible range of big mountains we've uh, we've got, uh, and um, you know people have been living and working in the Alps now for hundreds of years. We've got these stunning snowy peaks, and um, yeah, since the Victorian era, uh, Brits have been going over there and um, foraging new routes at one point, um, and it's been a regular feature uh, for British mountaineers. Um, uh, everybody wants to get to the nice summits um, and yeah, you've got a, a big range of 4000 meter peaks, lots of slightly smaller ones as well. That 4000 meter mark seems to be a big draw for people. Um, and the tallest of which is Mont Blanc. Um, 
That's uh, a couple of lads very pleased to get to the summit of there. And you definitely feel the altitude. So it's a big difference uh, to uh, say UK winter mountaineering or something like that. Uh, so we're in a very different environment uh, to a Scottish winter environment. Um, it's quite dry. <laughs> that's, that's a big difference. And quite broadly as well, I mean, the Alps, whilst we've got big glaciers, a lot of the peaks are rocky. Uh, so many of the ascents on these uh, on these mountains are rocky ridge lines um, with a glacial approach. So when it comes to traveling in this environment, the first thing that we need to start thinking about is how we move around on a glacier. OK, that's a very different um, scenario to being um, on mountains in the UK. So using a rope to protect ourselves when we're walking on the flat seems like a, an, an odd thing. We're not inherently scared of the flat, so it's hard to anticipate what's going to happen. So an introduction to that environment and a training in the things you might do if things go wrong are important. It's also um, hard to put into your planning when you're not that used to it. Um, you know, when you get up in the morning in a hut and you're looking out the window and you're going across a glacier, ideally you've had a freeze overnight, you have visibility and there's a track from where other people have gone. And if you lose two of those three, you really shouldn't be wandering around. Because um, if somebody does go into a crevasse in poor weather, it's going to be hard to get them out. But then you might have somebody that's even with a tweaked knee, a bit immobile, and you're out in your own in bad weather and you're not getting a helicopter. So crevasse rescue, um, that's, that's a primary skill for this environment. And it's not just the uh, the nature of the rescue process it's an appreciation of of what that would feel like and uh, the things that could go wrong so you could create a, a, a crevasse scenario where you go well i couldn't get somebody out of there and we need a helicopter uh, but in general uh, as long as ropes are well managed and routes are well chosen uh, nobody's going to go very far if they do pop into a hole uh, and would hopefully be able to climb out themselves if that's not possible, then we're going to need to create some sort of anchor uh, and it's a snow anchor. So that's a judgment call. You're going to need to have some idea of what good snow is and what bad snow is and how to put one in and then um, create a hoist system to pull someone out unless they're capable of climbing themselves out. So uh, that's one of the things we uh, spend a reasonable amount of time doing on an introductory course in the Alps. Um, it's worth noting somewhere like New Zealand, where they have very big holes in their glaciers, they would spend three full days doing that. Um, it's, a, it's a much bigger part of their skill set than it maybe is in the Alps, where it's um, still a danger, but maybe on a smaller scale. And that builds that appreciation, that awareness of the hazard, how to manage it and what to do if something does happen. So they, then you're in a strong position to travel. Um, and so you can uh, you can start looking at planning your first trips out. So when we set off on an alpine peak, often we're setting off in the dark. Alpine days start early and finish early, and that's because the white stuff tends to thaw out through the day and it's uh, much safer when it's frozen solid. So we set off early doors. We've got a head torch on um, and then later in the day we're coming through. This is a dry glacier scenario, so the winter snow's melted off. It's midsummer and this is in the Oberland. So we're on the biggest glaciers in Europe now. And that environment requires pretty good footwork. You're going to be want to be fairly confident on, on your crampons moving around these little blocky um, edges to that usually not that deep the holes, but I mean the terrain would be unpleasant if you slip down one side or the other. And navigation's difficult. You need to be able to see what you're doing. You need to be able to um, pick a path through this labyrinth um, and often getting a kilometre through this sort of terrain can be uh, the slowest part of the day, um, you know, getting to the uh, exit from the glacier uh, and up to an alpine hut. So having some familiarity with your footwork and ability to use crampons on icier terrain. And then the next big difference uh, from a UK mountaineering background is moving together. So we have a lot of moderate terrain on ridge lines where it's not technically difficult. It's not dissimilar to walking on steeper terrain, but it is exposed. Um, there's nothing to fix a rope to. There's no way of anchoring. So we need to use the way we move and the way the rope runs on that terrain 
to provide some degree of safety. It's a safety net. Um, you're not going to stop um, a stumble or, or shortfall, but you are going to stop people going any distance using the rope. So being aware of how much rope to have out, how to hold the ropes, when to take coils, and how, how to stop and just change things for a short period of time. That fluidity to the decision making in the Alps, uh, that's the cornerstone of safe travel on ridgelines. A lot of the first ascents of these mountains were done on the ridges because of this, because just wandering through the blocks and one side of a ridge or another provides that safety with the rope running over the ridge line itself. And so you don't need any specialist equipment. What you need is good judgment and good movement skills. Um, you want uh, reasonable balance um, is, is a prerequisite to being on, on those, those alpine ridge lines. So once you've got those two things in place, once you've got an ability to move around uh, safely on glaciers and appreciation of how you would approach uh, a rescue scenario, and some awareness of how to move on a snow ridge line like this or a rocky ridge line, as we saw earlier. Those are the uh, the basics of moving in this um, bigger scale, challenging terrain. Um, and those things you can put in some place, um, short training routes, days on glaciers, uh, and then picking uh, a bigger objective for your first trip out. So uh, we're going to look at a run of slides here. I've got of the Guida Tour in Chamonix which is a very popular uh, first trip out for people. Uh, and um, I managed to coax, coax my family out on their first Alpine trip. Um, and so we went up with my son, who was 18 at the time, and then um, um, wife and the younger of the sons who stayed at the hut. So a lot of Alpine trails up to huts are uh, very well prepared. It's the guardian's responsibility uh, to make sure that the path is safe. Anywhere where it's a little exposed, there'll be fixed chains or bits, bits of fixed rope and things. And a lot of hikers in the Alps will go up to huts, have lunch and come down because the scale's too big to go to tops and back. Uh, huts become objectives in themselves uh, for people. The huts do dinner, bed and breakfast. So they're, they're serviced. They have a guardian who runs the place, a kitchen. Uh, they provide an evening meal, um, dormitory accommodation and then some sort of breakfast in the morning, continental breakfast, some bread and some coffee. Um, and uh, those are the dormitories. So it is communal, earplugs are essential. Um, you take a sleeping bag liner with you. Um, the family got the full experience. We had a couple of uh, snorers on the top bunks in the room. Uh, so everybody got to appreciate what it can be like. Uh, and then I think for the only, uh, the only occasion ever uh, in my experience of having teenage children, was getting um, woken up early at four o'clock going, can we go now, Dad? So Alex was quite excited to get out the door and do his first Alpine peak. So up early, by the light of the head torch, a little bit of a recce the day before, so you know the way down onto the glacier or the first part of your route, because you're going to be a bit groggy and um, it is dark. It's hard to judge uh, where things are and scale and uh, so if you've if you've had a quick look at the route the day before and often it's that getting through the rocks and onto the glacier the first part of the day and then um, roping up putting the crampons on there's just two of us on this trip and there's a little bit of a weight difference between uh, Alex my son there and I so there's some knots in the rope that's going to make a rescue harder but it would eat up some of the pull if um, I was to pop into a hole and the weight was to go on Alex. We've dr drilled all the possibilities before we've got to this point, uh, but that's as um, having the sun come up on us. Uh, it's always a great part of the day when you get to see the uh, the terrain around you. And after a glacial approach, this uh, the Guida Tour leads up onto a, uh, a rocky ridge. Chamonix is great having such wonderful granite. Uh, it's always nice rock to climb on and uh, it's got a good grain to it, so it get, you get reasonable grip in your boots, and it's often blocky, edgy, uh, and has spikes on the ridges. So that, that climbs well in big boots. It's good for moving a rope around. Uh, other rock types like limestone peaks in the Oberland, and things like that can be a little uh, less um, easy to, to move around safely. Might need more equipment and a better awareness of using that. 
So yeah, we rattle up the ridge line and uh, onto the summit of the Agreda tour. Um, it's always nice to get your top. Good weather. We had a bit of cloud uh, coming in on us as we came up to the top of the glacier. We weren't quite sure we were going to get above it, uh, but as we got up to the top, that kind of dropped down as it often does and dissipated. Uh, so we got a nice, nice clear morning. Weather generally in the Alps, um, you know, we get good periods uh, of settled weather in the summer, um, and the. Uh, you know, the seasons have been getting longer because we've been having hotter summers. Uh, the glaciers can get a bit uh, melted out through the middle of the summer, uh, but it does mean we can start a bit earlier, sort of late May, and finish a bit later, sort of into uh, late September, early October. Um, and uh, yeah, like I said earlier, your choices for travelling on glaciers are to some degree determined uh, by weather because you do need to be able to see what's around you and you do need the snow to have some freeze to it um, and that's at odds with a lot of um, navigation skills people may build in Scotland in winter. Um, the hazards you've got, the, the, the things you need to navigate around aren't necessarily part of the detail you have on your map. So um, it's route choice rather than uh, navigation and that often requires visibility. Um, so yeah, we wind our weary way back to the valley and we're down by one or two o'clock. Bit of afternoon time, maybe go rock climbing. Um, and rock climbing, you know, but rock climbing is its own sport, but now seems so apart from mountaineering that people can start to lose how the two join together. Uh, but historically, mountaineers would do a bit of rock climbing at home before they went to the bigger ranges. Once you're up high, you're a little tired. You may be suffering from the altitude. That's not an environment where you want to try to learn new skills. So you build the skills in a small rocky location and then you take them higher in the mountains. It's not just climbing steep rock. To be frank, for mountaineering, a lot of the time, the grade you climb is irrelevant. It's being familiar with the use of the rope, carabiners, knots. Here on, again, this is our introductory course uh, for alpine climbing. Uh, we're getting ourselves out of a hole. That's something I need to do frequently. Um, the, uh, yeah, the, the, the little bits of skills that add up to you having solutions to problems in the mountains are all built here, cragging environment. Uh, OK, uh, and also some of those physical skills and appreciation of where to look for holes, how to move your feet. Those build into uh, a set of skills that give you good coordination and reasonable balance. That's transferable directly into moving around in even moderate mountaineering terrain. Where, where so would think, you say um, indoor climbing sort of fits into this, Andy, if at all? I mean, is it worth doing indoor climbing before heading out to the Alps? Absolutely. It's one, one of the things that's been striking over the last 10 years working with people in the Alps is the number of people that have done no rope climbing, but have been uh, bouldering. OK, and boulder can be quite physical, but walls are pretty good for setting stuff uh, that's that's not not, you know, not too demanding. Uh, you're not pulling on your arms. You're just moving around on lower angle terrain. Uh, and that obviously, um, you know, it's, it's, it's obvious to me that that gives them a set of skills that makes it safer for them in that environment and more enjoyable. They can just approach a challenge uh, with some physical capacity. Um, so. Often on days in the Alps when we've got an odd day between a hut trip or um, sufficient time before we go to a hut, uh, we'll go out and do often quite moderate rocky routes. You know, you can do some of this in big boots or approach shoes, but like I say, it's good training. You're also building um, that capacity to cope with exposure, um, have, you know, being able to be aware you're in a vertical situation, but put it to one side. As this man is doing here. OK, so ridge lines, a lot of it is about separating what you're doing from where you are. Uh, this is uh, this is actually on the Stockholm, uh, which is on the uh, eastern side of the Oberland, so the Valais um, side, Zermatt behind us uh, from there. Absolutely superb rock. Um, no glacier on the approach. Uh, you don't need axe or crampons for this, um, but uh, you couldn't have a finer mountaineering route. Just perfect. Um, so yeah, those skills we've built 
take us to these big mountains. You don't go on something like the Matterhorn and up the Herney Ridge without having reasonable uh, ability to move around. You need to over um, state your level before you go to the big mountains because you need to move at speed. You need to down climb as well and you've got a rucksack on. So there's, a, there's other aspects that add to uh, the difficulty. So you want a reasonably, you know, you, you want a, a grade two, le two levels higher than what you're going to find in the mountains. Um, so a, a, lot, a lot of these peaks, even if they are mainly snowy, uh, you're going to have some, some rocky scrambling to get onto the summit. And as snow disappears, what it can leave behind is not always uh, entirely solid. You might have blocks that can move a bit. Uh, so you need to be able to use your feet well and not necessarily grab things and pull out on them. Um, sometimes things need keeping in place rather than pulling on. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a skill that gets built with time in the mountains. So yeah, the exposure of it all is, um, you know, this can be hard for people to cope with sometimes, but it's certainly part of the appeal. Um, not difficult climbing, not hard climbing, but uh, it's almost like like flying in a plane sometimes. Um, this is the Northridge on the Xenal Rotorn. And so this was done uh, late 1800s in a day from the valley, which is an enormous feat um, with what would have been very rudimentary equipment, a bit of hemp rope tied around your middle and that was that. Uh, but because they could move the rope one side of this ridge or the other, uh, the potential for something, you know, the whole team falling off the mountain, uh, is very small indeed. It's just um, airy and requires uh, yeah, a calm head. And, and is there a way that people can prepare, say in the UK, you know, to deal with this sort of level of exposure? I mean, I suppose, you know, really going on more exposed scrambles in Snowdonia, those sorts of places is the only way you can really prepare for, yeah, that, that, that feeling that you would have being on such an exposed lump of rock there. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we we have a mountain environment in Snowdonia, the Lake District in Scotland that provides us access to some of this. But in terms of, of, the, of the, the scale, um, uh, I'll be honest, uh, it, it's it's a whole level of difference. Um, and, and so that um, that feeling of exposure it, it is, it is much higher uh, in the Alps than, than it is in the UK environment. Yeah, so often you're, you've got plenty of room to stand. Um, it's a bit like stepping from one bar stool to another bar stool on the on on the ridge lines. Um, and yeah, good balance. Um, you know, things that you can do to build balance. Um, a very important part of the skill set. Um, and then uh, a lot of these peaks. Uh, this is the Don de Géon, uh, which isn't. Uh, particularly hard in the scale of things peak to climb. It has fixed rope on it, so that's going to require some arm strength, as the Matterhorn will as well. Uh, but it is more like being on a rocky face. Now that can be technically harder, but you feel a lot less exposed than you would on a ridge line. So in terms of um, how daunting it can feel, it can actually be easier for people to climb uh, a tougher rock face than an easier ridge. You've got something to hold on to, you, your hands are on things, you're not as dependent on just your feet. Uh, and then moving on from that sort of thing, uh, a lot of Alpine regions, Chamonix most notably, uh, have superb rock climbing in an env environment that's Alpine. So you've got a glacial approach. It may or may not go to a summit, it might just be a route in itself. Uh, but often because this stuff has been smoothed by glaciers or is in the high mountains where um, poor rock has exfoliated. The quality of the climbing and the quality of the terrain is just superb. Uh, it's world class, um, very enjoyable. Um, so, not all of the routes in the Alps are rocky. We've got still got a lot of big snow and ice faces and um, uh, gully climbs. Uh, these were climbed later in the history of the Alps because. Uh, the equipment is more specialist. You know, you need, you, it wasn't until you had good crampons, ice axes, some potential for protection like ice screws, um, that these things became 
um, more um, reasonable objectives. Conditions are key, so you, you, you need to be able to judge the condition of the climb because you're going quite a long way and if it's too icy or the snow is too soft, travel is going to be much harder and often on easier sections you have no choice other than to, to move together again uh, and that's quite exposed. So it requires good choice uh, of conditions. Often this sort of thing is only climbable really in the early season, so late May um, into June and later in the season, especially if we get some snow later on, so mid-September into October um, for, for a lot of the mixed climbing as well. So yes, it's committing. Um, if we're in a high mountain environment, we have some hazard around us other than just the climbing. So on the rocky stuff, that can often be stonefall. Uh, and in the uh, snowy, icy terrain, seracs. A serac is an ice wall. It's a feature of glaciation in a lot of ways. It's just that the glacier is now very steep and instead of forming a crevasse, it's broken into a cliff. Um, seracs are under pressure from behind, so they're being pushed. The whole thing wants to travel under, under gravity and um, until temperatures rise a lot and they get water flowing under them, it's not really about day or night or time of day or whether it's hot or not, it's just the pressure. So, so it's a roll of the dice under Cerax. We avoid them, you know, you, we, we, we don't go near them. If you have to cross, then you do it quickly. Uh, you can only limit your time under Cerax. There's no other way of mitigating that. And then a lot of the terrain will climb up through maybe rocky bands and then out onto open slopes. Um, and through through the more technical terrain, it's often easier to arrange ways of managing or protect, protecting a party using technical equipment or ice screws. Once one to open slopes, it can be a little more difficult. Um, and um, sometimes you have to dig a fair bit if you're going to get to ice um, or keep the rope short and, and move the team together. But again, we want a reasonably high technical standard of ability here. Um, you, you don't want to be only familiar with climbing this sort of terrain. You want to be totally confident on this sort of terrain before you get into it. Um, and then as things get harder, it's more like this is more like a, maybe a Scottish snow and ice gully. Um, so we're using two axes, those reasonably technical axes and crampons. Uh, mountain ice, so a lot of the, rather than transform snow, the icy stuff, it's very bobbly, it's perfect, it's got air into it. Uh, and so some of the best ice I've ever climbed has, has been in the, um, the higher mountains in the Alps uh, because of the nature of the way it forms. Uh, and that means often it doesn't shatter, your picks go in really nicely, still good for screws. Uh, so that, that provides some really satisfying climbing. Um, it's great get, getting up a climb like this, you've set off in the dark, um, all the way up your axes have just been going in first swing, you've had some moderate technical difficulty and then you get to your summit, that, that's so rewarding, that's wonderful. And then there's narrower gully lines as well, so some of the, uh, especially in the granite regions where, you know, like Chamonix, you've got, you've got fairly narrow deep uh, chimney lines. Uh, early season, um, you have ice that forms from freeze thaw. This is much more like continental ice wall climbing, uh, but at altitude. Um, so you've maybe got a bigger pack on, um, and, and you, you definitely feel the air's a bit thinner. Um, but ju just incredible surroundings, the architecture of it, uh, the fact that you have this defined line of climbing, uh, it's just wonderful, just so stunning. Um, not always that long those climbs uh, or you could be up on Mont Blanc and there's some very challenging uh, chimney lines up on the uh, Italian side there. Um, a great way to reach the top. Good footwork, good footwork, the cornerstone of all good mountaineering. So you need to be confident in how these work and what's going to happen and um, that builds over time. We'll often have a day walking around on a glacier Again, that's a very different environment to being in Scottish snow and ice. It's often much softer in Scotland, um, whereas walking on glacial ice, once things get dry, uh, you're very dependent on uh, 10 points of contact on the bottom of your feet. Using the front points on steeper ground, that technique needs to, technique needs to be reliable. 
every time you do it needs to have the same outcome. So that needs to be well bedded in and maybe more technical environment before you get into the higher mountains. Um, uh, and um, yeah, it can be built quite quickly. Uh, it's just a question of providing a challenging environment where it's um, where it's all pushed along a bit. And as, as we've got a photo of a boot there, Andy, could you just explain sort of the differences between the different boots that we might recommend um, in the in for the Alps in terms of sort of stiffness and rating? You know, okay. what you might wear on a on a hot route, which is more of a glaciated track compared to something obviously here where it's you know it's on steep ice okay so i mean the the big differences between the boots are rigid rigidity and warmth okay so most of the time in mountaineering what we want is a platform to support a crampon it's a tool to help us do that and so the stiffer the boot is the better the crampon fits to it and the better the transference of force so we have a rigid boot, a B3 fully rigid boot. Our crampons will work better on ice, full stop, even if it's just walking around on the flat. Now, if the terrain is less challenging, so a lot of the time we're just going to be in easy mountaineering or general walking terrain, then we could move that down from a B3 to a B2 boot. That's got a little more flex in it, in it. might have a three quarter shank. And we would maybe need a crampon that isn't attached at the heel with a clip. It might strap onto the foot. It's a very reliable way of putting a crampon, but the crampon will need better technique. You'll need to be more familiar with its use because it won't just bite as you want it necessarily in all conditions, particularly if it's later in the summer and things are icier, uh, then you, um, you might want more familiarity. And we might even get back to that traditional technique of cutting a few steps in the ice using the back of the axe, even though we've got crampons on, uh, just to provide better steps for people uh, in lighter footwear. The stiffer boots tend to have more insulation as well. Fit to, to, to some degree affects how warm your feet feel because you need some room around your toes. Uh, but the bigger boots tend to have maybe some insulation material in there. So for something like Mont Blanc, and Mont Blanc is this big standout in terms of temperature in the Alps, often much colder there than anywhere else to go in the Alps because it's higher and you're on an exposed ridgeline, you get the wind. And so the stiffer boots, you might feel uncomfortable with lower down, but they are providing the warmth as well as the support higher on the mountain. So a big boot that's stiff is going to provide you something that will do all the jobs. A light boot that's flexible is more limited, but is, I mean, totally appropriate for something like the Hort route, uh, introductory climbing in a roller, uh, and a lot of the rocky scramble climbs as well. Uh, they're more tactile, you have better feel, um, so they can be better for that. Great. Right. And that was coming back to the, to, to the ice. So a lot, a lot of people who live on the continent have access to going ice fall climbing regularly or, or just doing a little bit. Um, it's a little more complex for us. We've got to go to Scotland. It's a bit more conditions dependent. Um, but just doing two or three days of this makes a massive difference to how you feel when you get onto a glacier, uh, move around on slightly steeper stuff. Somebody does pop into a crevasse climbing out of it. Uh, and often you end up coming onto moderately angled slopes going up or down where it's just a short section 20 or 30 meters of slightly steeper hard ice and having some experience of um, climbing uh, on ice falls will just make it just a world of difference you just kick it and know it's right and hit it and know it's right rather than being unsure it's where we build the skill and then sometimes it snows we don't always get perfect weather in the Alps. You might have a rocky ridge line uh, and you've got some fresh snow over it. And so you're going to now have to move over those rocks with your crampons on. Uh, that can best be described as indelicate and noisy. <laughs> it can be a bit scratchy. So uh, getting used to the fact that you've got an extra three centimetres on the bottom of your foot takes a little bit of time. The better you are already on those crampons, the easier that transition is going to be. You can't climb some things without the crampons, so you have to keep them on 
all the time. You might even have a rocky section that's um, completely clear, but you're coming onto ice or snow. So climbing rock and mixed terrain in your crampons is part of the skill set as well. That's building the two previous things where we put rock climbing on one side, ice climbing on the other, bringing the two things together. So your rock climbing ability, the, the, how you look at stuff and appreciate where your feet might go and how that's going to feel and where to move your gravity is now meeting up with your ice skills where you know how to use uh, crampons and what sort of edge they will hold on uh, and having that sort of tactile feel for what it's like having them on your feet. Um, and that's um, over in Chamonix. That's a ridge line we frequent. Um, good, good ridge traverse exposed scenario. Quite looking forward to getting back there soon. <laughs> Great. OK, well, that, that's um, that's fantastic, Andy. I think that's. Uh, yeah, really gives people a bit of a, an overview of of the differences and, and, and what's involved. So we'll move on to some Q&A. So if people want to use the Q&A function, then um, yeah, feel free to use that and we'll we'll ask some questions for Andy. I've got a, a couple of questions, Andy, that um, I mean, we, we obviously we have a series of Alpine courses and we work out of sort of five or six different bases or Alpine resorts. Can you just give us a bit of a you know, what's the difference between places like Arola in Switzerland, Zermatt, which obviously people have heard of, Sassgrund, Chamonix, you know, how do they compare? Um, just, just a brief sort of overview would be really helpful. OK, so um, so let's start at the beginning. If you're going to, uh, if you're new to this, it's nice to go somewhere quiet. Having a lot of people around you and things being busy, just detracts from that general feeling and the fact it, it, it makes you feel like you don't have time when of course you do but everybody's moving around you and there's a sense of bustle so a roll is perfect for that it's a little quieter there aren't only 4,000 meter peaks there so there isn't that inherent drawn there's no ski lifts so that brings a simplicity the village is quite high it's at 2,000 meters you get up in the morning you put your boots on you pick up your bag and you go up the hill uh, and that simplicity is a wonderful way to introduce the Alps to people. Moving on from that, next door we've got Zermatt, that's quite busy, there's a lot of people there. Big mountains, 4,000 meter peaks. We've got some great glacial trekking, uh, the Monte Rose is quite high, uh, second highest in the Alps, but then the big peaks there are big rocky ridge lines and so that's um, that's the next step up, shall we say, in terms of um, scale and terrain. So how do we go from that introductory stuff to those big rocky ridge lines? And Chamonix, whilst it's got Mont Blanc, and that's a draw in itself, Chamonix, which is you know, a lot of people say the centre of alpinism, it's certainly where a lot of technical alpine climbs are being, being done because of the nature of the rock. It's quite steep. It doesn't have a lot of easier climbs. But what it does have is a lot of shorter technical terrain, easy access with the lifts, and that provides a brilliant environment for moving people on technically so that they then take a step down technically, but up in scale on the Zermatt peaks. So that, that's it's like a bridge from one to the other by going up technically, but keeping it short and then putting those skills in place so people can move on. Sassgrund is often a good place to go if you've got your second alpine trip. Um, very um, pleasant mountaineering, 4,000 meter peaks, but with moderate uh, rocky ridge lines on them. Uh, so the rocky scrambling there, as well as some snow approaches, uh, but lift access. And that's a great thing in the Alps. I know there can be a bit of an eyesore and you've got to queue in the morning for them sometimes. But uh, in terms of being able to get the most mountaineering out of a week, somewhere like SAS, where you've got those lifts, I mean um, you don't have to spend a whole day getting to a hut. You can get on a lift, go to a summit and go to the hut in the evening. Uh, and it cuts down on the physical load for the week. Six days of consistent mountaineering is quite a lot. And if you can take one or two of those days easy by using lift access, it means your recovery is good and you get to climb an extra peak in the week. Um, the, then we've got the overland over the other side. That's a, that's that's a part of the Alps all on its own. Europe's biggest glaciers. Yeah. So the Alich Gletscher there is enormous. You, you, you come onto the top of that um, on the train coming up the inside of the Eiger and it's it's pretty much Himalayan in scale. That has a very different feel. 
you've got um, bigger distances to travel, a greater sense of commitment. Uh, it feels remoter. Uh, that's uh, absolutely we, we stunning. We often talk about our Oberlin 4000 as course as more of an expedition feel to it because you're up in the huts all week and it feels very remote. Is, is that sort of fair? Fair compared yeah. to the uh, absolutely. Yeah, you, you um, yeah, you, you you feel more like you're out in the middle of nowhere. Um, whereas you know somewhere like Chamonix, it's almost the opposite. You kind of yeah, you, you do get a better recovery. Uh, you have a lower physical load, um, and that allows you to push other things, skills based. Um, but in terms of um, feeling like you're immersed in the mountains, the Oberland's hard to beat, really. Yeah. Great. Um, OK, so we've got some some questions up here. Heather is asking, she said the last time I had crampons on was 10 years ago on Grand Paradiso, which is a mountain in Italy, highest mountain in Italy. Right now I should be doing the Jagged Globe Hope route to Mont Blanc with my husband who went ice climbing with you last year. Is there anything else you would suggest for me next year? I guess she means r rather than the Hope route to Mont Blanc. So, um, rather than the Hort route and Mont Blanc, well, I'm, I'm just, I'm just sort of, I think that's what Heather means. Um, you know, what, what, what would be another good sort of course to do? Well, if it's been a ten-year gap, uh, I don't know what you've been doing physically since then. So, how many times you've been out in the mountains? You know, that SAS course um, that provides you with uh, like a day-by-day -day approach, so you can change what you're doing through the week, and you're going up and down more. So yeah, your recovery is better uh, and um, you can maybe adjust or fine tune things bit, a bit more uh, and that can then lead into a Mont Blanc ascent if you wanted at the end of that. Um, yes, the Hort route is very straightforward terrain, um, but um, you might find you get more of reward out of something like the SAS course instead. Um, OK, great. Let, let's move on to another question. A um, couple of boot questions here. One from Tony, he says, which boots would you recommend for a B3, uh, B3 rated boot? And would you use double boots in the Alps? Great talk. Thank you. OK, I, uh, I haven't used double boots for a very long time since we stopped using plastic boots. Did quite a lot of my rock scrambling in plastics. It's what got me strong <laughs> as opposed to having good footwork. Um, so uh, the best boot is the boot that fits. Simple, OK? Everybody's foot is different. And if I was to say, oh, you should have um, La Sportiva's or, or something, they might not fit you. So uh, I, I fit Mindle boots and they're quite rare. Um, you don't see them in a lot of shops. Uh, it would be hard to recommend them for everyone because I have a very broad forefoot uh, and quite a narrow heel, but they work for me. So the fit is the most important thing to me because if, if, I mean, if they don't fit properly, your life's just going to be hell. Uh, and then the other things can be a little secondary. Um, there we go. Yeah, so Sam has sort of asked almost a similar question. Um, he or she has said, uh, I've recently bought some sort of Scarpa Mont Blanc Pros for beginning Alpine mountaineering. Would I find problems with the, with the rigidity or are they OK for kind of all round use? So they're they're obviously a yeah, B3 boot. Yeah, yeah. So, so you, you do get used to what you have. Like I say, I mean, when I, a lot of my alpine climbing was done in plastic boots, totally rigid, and we were doing rocky routes in those. Um, and you, you get used to it. Uh, those, the, the uh, Mont Blanc Pro, uh, and a lot of the um, B3 boots now have quite a light cuff on them, so there is mobility to it. Uh, you, um, they're reasonably tactile, and there's no reason you shouldn't be able to climb, you know, harder and more technical routes and there's no reason they shouldn't be comfortable but if you've got a long flat approach then there's no way that that is going to feel as nice on your feet as a b3 yeah the big question is what are you going to do the most of and then go for that uh, and then realize if you're making a compromise you might be able to fill that gap like with using a b2 boot but by having a higher standard so so yeah i can wear a b2 boot and, and still use my crampons well but because I've got very you know, good familiarity with using them. Um, so, so there might be a technical gap there, it might be a skill. You might be able to put that in place. 
OK, let's move on because there's quite a few questions here. Here's a here's one that um, people will be interested in. What trips, climbs would you recommend to gain experience before attending the Matterhorn, says John? OK, so uh, what the, Matt, the Matterhorn requires two things, fitness and technical ability. OK, so you want to turn up in the Alps aerobically fit. OK, ideally with some experience of rock climbing recently. So you want a reasonably good standard. And one of the things I really notice with people is fitness in the arms as well as the legs. So runners and cyclists, they've got lungs, but you're going to be using your arms a lot. Um, uh, and anybody that's done any rowing always does extremely well on the Matterhorn. Um, in terms of a preparation week for it, then uh, somewhere like Chamonix is good because you've got the technical stuff and you've got the altitude. So you get people out on technical terrain and you, um, you also acclimatise because the, the Matterhorn's high. Uh, what you don't do is do the length of day, but then it's like, you know, it's like training for a marathon. There's no point in running a marathon the week before and considering that training. So the aerobic fitness can go in place in a in long-term training beforehand with some technical input, and then something like a um, Chamonix-based week beforehand would then put in place that ability to move around uh, to a reasonable degree with, with some background in technique. OK, great. And th this leads on from that in a way. Um, Rich is asking, apart from technical skills, what physical training would you recommend in the UK prior to tackling a 4000 metre peak? So, rowing. so um, I mean, everybody, everybody's different. OK, I always found cycling was better than running for mountaineering. I think it's just something to do with cadence and resistance. I don't know. But uh, walking around in big boots and uh, on steep hills, it uh, doesn't feel very much like running, but it does feel a little more like cycling. It's just just that that push thing. Um, so that that worked better for me. Circuit training. So you are going to want to use your out uh, your arms. And so I have found nothing better than going rock climbing, really. Yeah. OK, um, somebody's asking anonymous. What's what's the thing you most enjoy about Alpine mountaineering? Um, the sense of freedom. OK, we'll, 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 we'll leave that one there. That's great. Uh, if you have practical general mountaineering skills in the UK, including Scottish winter, is there a low cost way of learning glacier skills in the Alps without going on a, a week long Alpine skills course? Yes, I mean, you can uh, get a book and watch some videos. OK, and then take all that information to find yourself somewhere safe and, and, and practice it there. Um, so you, you can you can we don't do crevasse rescues on a crevasse. We find somewhere with a steep banking or an icy edge and we do it there. So if it doesn't work out, you can just walk around the side. Don't go jumping into holes and practicing it. OK, uh, and uh, then go somewhere quiet and go somewhere easy and just give it a go. So you've got a background that's technically higher than the terrain you're on. OK, so we shouldn't be worrying about falling over or off. OK. Only do it in good weather uh, and and then build that skill base step by step. So go and do five, ten easy routes before you move on to another one. So you're taking your technical skills to a new environment and building an experiential base to move forward. Right. Um, somebody's asking best alpine routes for first season, having good Scottish winter and scrambling experience. The best alpine routes. <laughs> the, uh, that, the, the, I mean, the, the, the nature of the climbs is so incredibly different. So you could say the South Ridge on the Dom Blanche is one of my favourites. So that's a rocky scramble, uh, but you wouldn't go and do something of that scale as your first route. Uh, a lot of people go to Chamonix for the first time. Those short technical climbs uh, can be quite daunting if you're coming from a UK background because you've got uh, the glacier to deal with. Uh, and um, the technical standards are a little too high. That might be the standard you're operating at at home. Somewhere like SAS often provides a good stepping stone. Um, so uh, the mounds aren't too big, the routes aren't too long, and nothing's terribly hard. Um, so that's, that's often a good place to get started. Um, yeah. OK, um, just, just, just to say, if anybody wants to ask a question, uh, please go for it now, because I'm going to close off the... Uh, the questions we've got a couple more here. Uh, I think this is quite an interesting one that you can maybe um, uh, tell us a bit more about, Andy. So Phil is asking, can you advise 
uh, our rope distances between two equally skilled people on an AD grade ridge moving together. Now, obviously, you talked a little bit about this, but if you can explain maybe a bit more about how moving together might might work on a typical route. So when we move together on an AD ridge, we are um, uh, putting sufficient distance between us to allow us to use the terrain, and that might that that might change depending on how blocky it is. Um, so the less there is in terms of protection from the terrain, the shorter we have the rope. So if you're on a steep icy slope where there's no way of mitigating this other than just holding the rope, then you would have people as close as you can. The more you get into rocky terrain, the more you want the rope as long as you can, but still have it with reasonable communication and not too much drag. So you would maybe go to five, six, seven meters on a rocky ridge line. And then as it got slabby, you might shorten that up again. And then as it got steep, you might put it put in a pitch. So it constantly changes. And that's part of the skill with moving together is to be constantly thinking, what do I need to do now? What do I need to do now? What do I need to do now? It, it, the moment you start going, right, it's five meters and we're off. And I'm going to keep it five meters for the whole of this climb and then back. That, that's not the approach is adaptability and being prepared to change. A function of that is often going, oh, do you know what? I just wish I'd done that a, a little shorter or a little longer. Um, it's not perfect. And it would be, you know, if you've got an 1100 meter climb on the matter on, it would be impossible to keep it perfect the whole time. Um, so you, you must be in a position where you recognize that and then change appropriately as you go along. OK, excellent. OK, I think just la last question here. Um, another one about gear. This is Alex asking about axe leashes, yay or nay. What about sling types that clip into the harness? I think he means, you know, the tethers that we use more these days. Uh, so, you? yeah, we get rid of the axe leashes. Um, so most of the time in the Alps, you're zigzagging on a slope and you're changing frequently from one hand to the other. So the leash just gets in the way. The leash is there, really, if you're going to swing the axe as a you know, in technical terrain. Um, and that's where it becomes appropriate. Often that's in terrain where you start to use two tools. It may take a leash and have it in the top of a rucksack and put it on the axe later. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the more exposed things get, the tighter you hold onto the axe, it's highly unlikely you'll drop it. Um, and if you're on easy walking terrain, you might accidentally let go of it, but it's flat, so not such an issue. So yeah, we get rid of leashes. Super. OK, Andy, well, that, that was uh, that's brilliant. I think we'll we'll leave it there. So thanks very much for that. A lot of uh, information in there for people to absorb. Um, so, yeah, we uh, glad, glad we got you eventually. And uh, yeah, we'll <laughs> see you again next time. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> OK, no problem. Thanks. Right then. So, uh, yeah, we'll wrap it up there. So thanks for joining us again for this session today. Um, just a reminder that all of these presentations are on our YouTube channel, on the Jagged Globe YouTube channel, so you can, uh, they're recorded and you can uh, go, go and check them out if you missed any of these. Um, uh, yeah, and if you'd like to get in touch with us about mountaineering in the Alps, either this summer, uh, if we're able to go, assuming things open up, um, you know, until the end of, th through to the end of September, we'll be running courses or next year, then please get in touch by phone or email. Um, so yeah, so that's it, folks, for today. Um, look out for announcements for any future live events. We'll we'll publish information about that either on our news page, uh, well, on our news page and across all our social media channels. So uh, yeah, thanks again for joining us and uh, we'll see you again soon. Goodbye. <laughs>